by Professor Katie Lunyon, uh, who's a professor of dementia genomics at the University of Exeter. Hello, Katie. Hello, how are you? Very good, thank you. And uh, Leonardis uh, Shuras from Chu Noe. I've said that wrong, haven't you? You've told me how to announce this before because we've met many times. Just leave out the C at the front. So. Pulira. Mm. <laughs> Why did I put that in my mouth? Um, <laughs> who is a clinical lecturer in old age psychiatry at the University of Cambridge. And you're also a jobbing, jobbing clinician, right? Or were you? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And um, so you work in an NHS trust as well as the university and, yeah. and research is, is, how much of your time is research? So it's 50-50. So 50% 50 I work for the university and 50% for Cambridge Searing Peterborough NHS Foundation Trust. Fantastic. Well, thank you for taking the time to talk to us. In fact, actually, while we're on this subject, I'll, I'll come to you first. Could you could you introduce yourself, Leo? So, yeah, I'm Leo. As, as you already said, I spend half of my time doing clinical work, looking after people who are over 65 and might have any kind of psychiatric problem, including memory problems or dementia. And uh, for the other half of my time, I do research studying nowadays epigenetics in Lewy body dementia. Fantastic. That's um, and Lewy body. We should go. Out, is is one of the rarer forms of. Well, it's actually not as rare as we think. The latest evidence suggests that it's actually the second most common type of dementia in older people, and we often misdiagnose it. So clinically, we think it's much rarer than what we diagnose it. But when people study it in the lab, and when we look at the neuropathology study, it's actually the second most common type of pathology after Alzheimer's disease. Oh, that's interesting, because that's tricky as well, isn't it? I mean, one of the whole, one of the whole issues that comes up regularly is, is it's not just about timely diagnosis, but accurate diagnosis is important mm -hmm. because the type of uh, symptoms you'll experience and the treatments that are available and how the studies you can participate in vary depending on your dementia type. Exactly, it's very important to get the diagnosis right as early as possible, even without having a, a disease modifying treatment for the current treatment plan for the symptomatic management of, of the condition to have to have the right diagnosis. And that's why we do research to improve that and, and help Thank people. Thank you, Leo. A lot of people will have mixed dementia as well. So lots of people with Alzheimer's have Lewy body dementia as well. So it makes it even more complicated. Well, I was going to come to you now. Could you introduce <laughs> yourself, Kate? <laughs> so uh, I'm based at University of Exeter. I'm 100% research, well, about 80% research, 20% teaching. Uh, and again, I'm looking at epigenetics, <laughs> energy drink. Um, I'm looking at epigenetics, mainly in Alzheimer's disease, but actually more recently, we've started to look at a bit of Lewy body dementia. So Leo and I are actually collaborating on a few projects, which is really nice. Uh, oh, really? Aspects, no, yeah. I, and I paired you up just by chance, <laughs> but you were already working. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. So one of my PhD students has earlier this year gone to visit Leo and do some work in his labs because he's got some facilities we don't have here. I think that's one of the nice things about doing research in the UK is that it's very collaborative. So can I pick on you first of all, because we uh, right back at the start, you were, I don't know if you were watching at that point, but we had, um, we were joined by three people who uh, live with dementia every day and they picked up on the use of jargon and things like this. So can you just very simply for a wide audience, explain to me what epigenetics is and what genome genomics is are they the same what what are those two things so essentially one way to think about it is every cell in your body has the same underlying genetic code so your dna but uh different cell types and different tissues will produce different proteins and have very different functions and that's because specific genes are switched on and other genes are switched off at different times in development and during the life course uh, and essentially this is epigenetic mechanisms and it's a reason, for example, why your heart cells do a very different function to your skin cells. So normally in your body, these epigenetic processes will turn on and off certain genes uh, and that's part of normal development. And um, what we, we're interested in is whether these epigenetic processes are on genes um, in people with Alzheimer's disease. 
they might be switching on the wrong genes, for example. So when, when you're growing, for example, certain genes activate things to grow. And then when you reach a certain age, they say, stop. And when you get older, certain genes suddenly activate and say, right, you should start to be a, a awkward. <laughs> <laughs> That's like, you know, teenagers. Um, no, I'm, I'm, I digress. I'm making a joke about that. But um, so, and so what you don't know at the moment I mean, we know more, increasingly know more, but is, is whether there are certain genetic things that change in later life that mean that some people go on to develop certain types of dementias and other people don't. Yeah, so we know that genes are really important. And actually, a lot of the research in the UK in genetics has highlighted a lot of risk genes, which we know increase your risk of developing dementia. We know that genes don't explain all of disease incidents. So if we were to look at identical twins, in about 60% of cases, both twins will develop Alzheimer's disease. That means that 40% of the time, they've got the same genetic code, but one twin's developing the disease and the other isn't, which suggests that environmental influences are important. And that's where epigenetics comes in, because it essentially is that bridge between the environment and the genome or genetics. Oh, well done. That, that well described there. I, I completely get that. Um, so, so actually, well, let, let's, let's move on. Why don't you t t tell us about your research? So me or Leo, would you like to start? No, you go, you go first. We're with you. You go. Let's stick okay. with you. Okay. So essentially what we, there's a number of different epigenetic processes. And um, what we're interested in is uh, one called DNA methylation, which is essentially uh, a chemical tag that's added to the DNA that can turn genes on or off. And uh, most of our work is looking at the brain uh, samples of people who died with Alzheimer's disease and looking to see if there's altered levels of these chemical tags on specific genes. Uh, and what we found is that there are indeed altered levels of these chemical tags on uh, uh, specific genes, uh, particularly in areas of the brain associated with, for example, learning and memory, or uh, we know that there's accumulation of the toxic proteins in Alzheimer's disease, such as amyloid or, or tau protein. Along these lines as well, we're looking in blood samples from people who've had, uh, who have dementia to see if we can uh, see any changes there, because then that could potentially lead to um, uh, new biomarkers, which could be used to perhaps predict um, uh, whether people will later develop Alzheimer's disease, which could be important clinically. And I think one of the important things about epigenetics, which I didn't mention earlier, is that these changes are potentially reversible. So you can remove these chemical tags. So if we were to find out that a gene uh, we need to find out whether the, these uh, chemical tags essentially are causing the disease. But if we do manage to demonstrate that, then actually you could potentially remove these chemical tags and develop new treatments for the disease. Well, that, that's exactly the point I was going to ask. So you find out somebody has a certain genetic makeup that makes them, of course, so it's agreed that there isn't going to be one gene that that's the Alzheimer's gene. Because, you, as you said, some people can have certain, some people will and won't. The environmental factors are still a thing. But if a gene makes up, say, a certain percentage risk, there, there is the scientific capability of being able to turn that off. Yeah, and there was actually a really nice study uh, last year which showed that actually people who had a high genetic risk for Alzheimer's disease, you can actually modify it through various environmental or lifestyle factors. So it suggests that, yeah, genes aren't the only thing explaining disease risk and that a healthy lifestyle is also important. And so coming to you, Leo, how, tell us about your, your work. Well, thank you, Katie, for giving a very nice introduction and introducing the topic and make it easy. I mean, what we study here essentially is it's, it's collaborating with Katie. We are working on Lewy body dementia, studying DNA methylation in Lewy body dementia. We do this both in blood samples from people, people who come to our clinics with a, a diagnosis of Lewy body dementia and other types of dementia. And we want by studying their blood to understand a little bit better things around their immune system and how perhaps someone with Lewy body dementia is dif different to someone who has Alzheimer's disease or how someone with a mixed type of dementia, how, what we can pick up in their blood, because that would help us having a more accurate diagnosis. But one, one of the other important aspects is obviously look into the brain and try to find new treatments. And we do that as well in people who have donated their brains. We have samples from those and using a specific method 
called laser capture micro dissection. Essentially, we go with a microscope and we can select specific cells that have the Lewy bodies or the pathology and isolate those specifically and compare them with, with healthier cells from healthy people and see how their DNA methylome is different. So and different, that, sorry, no, no, carry on. That will help us to, to find new ways of treating the condition. And as Katie said, epigenetics are, can be reversed. And we actually have a lot of treatments and a lot of drugs that do modify the epigenome as it is called. And in other specialties in oncology, for example, those drugs, the epigenetic drugs are, are already used. So once we understand that a little bit better in the brain, we can perhaps use some of those developments as well. So is it likely, do you think, that certain uh, dementia types would have different genetic factors? I mean, certainly have different genetic factors. Are, you know, what I mean is, is it's a bit like cancer in that respect, isn't it? In, in so much as certain, mm -hmm. trying to get the point I'm trying to make here, is this, is there, a, if we don't know this yet, might we discover in the future that certain genetic factors are more influential for certain types of dementia than others, for example? Exactly, that's, that's what we are studying and that's what the research is all about, right? To understand that better. And as Katie said, some people might ha have, as we call it, pure Alzheimer's or pure Lewy body dementia and some other people might, might have a mixed dementia. And th there are some differences, either genetic or environmental, or epigenetic as our hypothesis is. And we, we try to understand that. Uh, Katie, what's what's the exciting thing in the field right now? What's 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 the, uh, you mentioned earlier that there was a paper published which already started to list out the genetic risk modifiable. And when we say modifiable, things you can change, genetic risk factors. Um, People should go look that up. I'll put a link out there later on um, because it is it, it is interesting that I, I, I'm slightly concerned myself because I know that I fit many of those modifiable factors and I, I should change. So are these are these factors that are lifelong or will they be, you know, are these things you don't have to worry about till you're 40? Can I smoke until I'm 30 and then I really should quit and, and lose weight only over 50, for example? <laughs> So I'm not a medical doctor, so I'm not going to give any medical advice whatsoever. Um, but there are some which are fixed. So, for example, age uh, increases your risk of developing dementia. We know that women are more likely to get Alzheimer's disease than men. Uh, but there's others that are modifiable. So, for example, the ones that were published this year show that a flu vaccination actually can protect you from developing dementia. Um, and uh, early life, lower BMI as well can protect you as well. So it does suggest that it's not just looking after yourself as you get older, but actually looking after yourself when you're younger as well. There's evidence now to suggest that the proteins that we see um, uh, going wrong in the brain of people with Alzheimer's disease, these can be positive 10, 20 years before you actually start to get symptoms of the disease. So actually that is during midlife. So we should be trying to be healthy earlier in life as well. Throughout life. And of course, there are lots of ways to do that. I mean, governments can influence that through their policies, through trying to make sure that people have good nutrition and good road safety and, and <laughs> you know, or parks and recreation areas and things like that. And there are things that you can do as individuals as well. So, so that research is published. Everybody can go find that. And that's uh, Exeter Dementia's website, I think, has certainly got that published, hasn't it? Yeah, I think there's a link to it. It wasn't done by our group, uh, but some other groups that are next to were involved in it. So what's exciting in your group coming up now, Katie? Um, so probably, so we're doing some uh, genetic engineering at the moment. So we're essentially growing some cells in a dish. And where I said earlier, we don't know whether these epigenetic changes we identify are causing the disease or they're there as a consequence of the disease. So we can essentially use genetic engineering to add these chemical tags to the bit of the DNA that where we've seen the difference and then see how these cells respond to the toxic proteins in Alzheimer's disease like amyloid and tau, which can help us to work out whether they're causing the disease. Um, some other projects we've got going on, which are quite exciting is uh, we're looking in the brain of people who had an infection at the time of death. So about 80% of people with uh, dementia die with a systemic infection. So pneumonia or urinary tract infection. And what we're interested in is whether this might lead to 
increased inflammation in the brain, which actually might be detrimental and actually kill nerve cells. Um, and then I suppose another project that we just started, which is quite exciting, is looking at psychosis and Alzheimer's disease. So where I say psychosis, it's not where you typically think of schizophrenia, but I think a lot of people who um, have, uh, who know patients with uh, dementia, they know that um, they often have delusions or hallucinations so they think their carer might be stealing from them or that their spouse is having an affair and we call this psychosis um, and what we know is that individuals who have psychosis um, have a worse disease course and decline quicker with the disease so we're trying to do some epigenetic studies now uh, in the brain of people who had psychosis uh, and Alzheimer's disease and compare them to people who didn't have psychosis to see if we can work out you know, what genes might be involved in that mechanism, which then could potentially lead to new treatments because the treatments currently used for it probably aren't very suitable. So that's, I mean, this is great. I mean, this is something that I think everybody can understand is, is if we identify these things, there are known treatments that can actually do this. It's just knowing where to, where to and how to and when to apply that to that you've got to find the target for that for that genetic treatment for us yeah and there's i, I suppose like science I mean, is, might again i might be simplifying there if i know well science is very collaborative so there's huge online data resources now so you can essentially um look at uh genes being expressed uh, when cells have been treated with different drugs and then you can perhaps look at how that matches to the changes you're seeing in the brain and perhaps use that to identify drugs that potentially could correlate with the changes you're seeing in the brain so repurposing of drugs is quite an active avenue of research at the moment. And we've got somebody from uh, the University of Oxford later today talking exactly about about that. Um, so, Leo, what about you? What, what where are you, where's your breakthrough going to come? What are well, you most optimistic for right now? Well, at the moment, as I said earlier, we have two avenues of work. First, we're looking into the blood samples of people with Lewy body dementia. We have been to our clinics, and a lot of them had a lot of brain imaging as well. And we are now able to pick up a signature in the blood relating to the immune system and the epigenetic profile of the immune system in the blood and how this relates to brain-related changes from brain imaging studies that we have. So that's something very important in, in understanding how, how perhaps changes that are occurring in every cell in our body, in, in the blood, can give us information about what is happening in the brain. And the other thing that we are working on is isolating cells that have the Lewy bodies, have the pathology in the brain, and studying the profile of those and understanding how why those cells are getting Lewy bodies while nearby neurons from the same person don't have Lewy bodies and function relatively healthy. That's, I mean, that's, that is interesting in so much as, so you we talked, we touched at the start about the difficulty in, in people being misdiagnosed with Lewy body dementia. Is there, is there, how is that going to improve? I mean, it's part of the work we talked. So we should talk about biomarkers are the indicate we mentioned earlier. Bio Why don't you tell us what a biomarker is, Katie, just for the people who don't know? Uh, so probably should have asked the clinician rather than the oh, researcher. Sorry, Leo, <laughs> tell us what a biomarker is. So a biomarker, essentially, it's something that we have from a living person, a biological measure, biomarker, that can tell us whether someone has a condition or not. Like, for example, measuring the blood pressure of someone and saying that they have high blood pressure or measuring high cholesterol and saying that they have problem with their cholesterol. Those are biomarkers. And for example, measuring something in the blood of someone or in the, in the spinal fluid and picking up a protein that can tell us whether someone has Alzheimer's disease or Lewy body and, dementia. And there's a whole range of dedicated research to biomarkers. Yeah, it's, it's a very big field and you might have seen recently there is a very new exciting test that can tell with very high accuracy whether someone has the Alzheimer's pathology in the brain. I think it's gonna reach the clinical field very soon, soon measuring the tau protein. The first results have been very encouraging. That, but, that's a whole research field in its own right is biomarkers. Yeah, I know later we're yeah. gonna be talking to somebody from UCL that's working on the blood, the blood-based, because that's the, 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 the dream, isn't it? It's just having a blood test that would say, oh yeah, you have 
outside. But, but for example, people have mixed pathologies. So people with Lewy body dementia, about half of them might also have the pathology of Alzheimer's disease in their brain. So it uh -huh. might be very difficult. So tell me, how do you diagnose somebody with Lewy bodies as opposed to another dementia? What's the difference? So there are the consensus criteria for diagnosing that. So they are based on clinical criteria and biomarkers. Usually people with Lewy body dementia, when they present with the memory problems, they might have very similar memory problems to Alzheimer's disease, but they are more likely to have visual hallucinations. So they will see things that other people cannot see. Sometimes they see animals or they see other humans. And also quite common, they might have sleep problems. They might have a sleep condition called REM sleep behavioral disorder. So they will act out on their dreams. And another issue that people with limb body dementia might have is develop Parkinson's disease. So they have both memory problems and motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. So why do you think this is misdiagnosed? Is this purely because the, the standard belts and braces diagnosis doesn't ask the right questions or people don't answer in the right way? Why I think because... I think because not all people will present to their clinician with the, this constellation of symptoms. Once they have, as we call them, three core symptoms, it's very accurate to diagnose them. But what happens most often is that people have start with memory problems. They are very similar to Alzheimer's disease. And later on, they start to develop those more distressing symptoms. And then we don't really know if that is behavioral problems, behavioral and psychological problems associated with Alzheimer's disease that are also common, or there is some other pathology in the brain as well. That makes absolute sense. Um, just a reminder to everybody um, that uh, you can ask questions. Uh, you can post those in the comments section on YouTube if you have questions, or you can use the Q&A box at uh, the bottom of the Zoom if you're watching via Zoom. Uh, please do post your questions for uh, Katie and Leo, and I'll put those, those to them. Um, I, I was going to come back to to you, Katie. So you you described the work that you've got going on there. What what are, what's coming up for you in the next? I mean, how has COVID affected your research? I mean, have you been able to carry on? Is are, are you adapting to the new circumstances? So we're back in the lab now. So we've been back in the lab probably for about six weeks. Uh, obviously, it has to be very coordinated and very organised to uh, make sure that people are, are, are safe in the labs. Uh, there was obviously a three, three, four month lull in being able to actually generate any new data. I suppose one advantage of working in the genetics area is that you generate vast quantities of data and you never have enough time to analyze it. Uh, so we've been quite busy analyzing data and writing up papers. So although we've had to put a number of new projects on hold, it's actually given us the opportunity in some ways actually to finish off some old projects from last year and actually get some data hopefully published. Some, some catch up and, and obviously, um, you know, keeping working on this to hope for that breakthrough sounds sounds important and of course money for alzheimer's research uk will find its way through to uh, katie and others working in this field to help um leo what about what about you i mean obviously i assume you've been working in the yeah oh. so so as a clinician i had to shift my work pattern so i was working 100 percent clinically uh, during the, the lockdown period to help out with staff shortages and all the rest but now we are getting back to doing the the research work, start to get our first participants coming back to the studies and trying to catch up with the lab work as well. And that, that's a concern, isn't it? I think, I think from some of my, from my day job, of course, I'm not doing this as part of my day job. This is just me doing this. But um, is a concern that people will be staying away from memory clinics, that they won't, they, they will be afraid to go into yeah. their GP surgery and get that referral. And I know diagnosis rates mm. have dropped over yeah. the last few months and so it is encouraging people that it's safe to go back and it is really important that people do get we try to take every precaution and and make it make sure that people who come in it's safe to do so and obviously we've changed all of our protocols and the way we do things to ensure that when we recruit someone it is safe yeah. to do so but it is a concern in the long term a lot of the memory clinics are now take take place remotely and it is difficult to get people to, 
to research. Yeah. And Katie, I assume you use, do you use tissue from brain banks and things like that as well? If you, you mentioned before about the, looking at infections that were in the brain present at, at death. Yeah. So yeah, we're using tissue from about six of the UK brain banks at the moment. Actually, some of our projects are currently on hold because we're waiting for obviously some clinical staff to be able to come back to the brain banks and actually for them to start operating uh, again. So there is a slight delay on that uh, for some uh, for some brain bags, which I suppose happen with clinical staff. Yeah, and that, that's something. So there are a few things that people can do. The Brains for Dementia Research Project is is a real thing. If people would like to participate in that, you can find the. Uh, it often gets abbreviated to BDR, but if you Google Brains for Dementia Research, you'll find information there on how you could possibly donate, uh, which would help help the work that's here. I think Leo would advocate that anybody that's having symptoms to make sure you're go to your GP, uh, don't delay, do get, get checked out. We do have a couple of final, uh, very quick questions. Um, Gemma Townsend asks, can a test be done to see if you're genetically predisposed to Alzheimer's disease? So it's a bit of a difficult question. So to keep it short, yes and no. So there is the early form of dementia when people develop it early on and they can ask their neurologist or psychiatrist to arrange for a genetic test to help with the diagnosis if they get it early on in their 50s or 40s. So there is a small number of people who get it. But for the most common late onset form of, of dementia or Alzheimer's disease, the genetic tests are not very accurate yet. So there is very little use of, of doing them to predict whether someone will get it or not. Thank you, Leah. Um, so um, I think hopefully that's answered your uh, question, uh, Gemma. Um, Terry Blatter asks, how do we measure the importance of administering medication for Parkinsonism symptoms in Lewy bodies when there could be implications with cognitive factors? So there that's, are, there are treatment guidelines. There are treatment guidelines and obviously we have to look at it on an individual basis. So whether the, the balance of risk and benefits to the individual patient is worth to do so. So there's no standard answer to that, mm. is there? I, 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 I would say um, uh, somebody who hasn't put their name in. My husband is in care with uh, BVFTD. How can we become involved with any research that might be ongoing, particularly blood samples to Leo and Katie's groups? I'm going to suggest, first of all, you go and if you have a look at joint dementia research at nhr.ac.uk, many of the studies that are looking for physical people to participate will um, try to find them through that service. So if you register on Joint Dementia Research, you'll register for yourself, or you can sign up somebody else as well if you can uh, act as their representative. That will be a way in. And, and do have a look for Brains for Dementia Research as well. Um, they are always looking for people, particularly with the rarer forms of dementia um, as, as well. Thank you very much. We're out of time. Thank you, Katie and Leo. It's been fascinating. And thank you ever so much for finding time to talk to us. Thank you for organising. That's Thank all you. right. Thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll let you go.